Welcome back to Machine Learning Foundations. In the last episode, you got an introduction to machine learning and you saw how it works from a programmer's perspective by having you create answers and data and letting a computer infer the rules that determine them. This is fundamentally different from traditional programming where you have to figure out the rules, express them in code, and then have them act on data to give answers. You created your first neural network, a single layer with a single neuron, to figure out the relationship between two numbers, and then you had an exercise to see if you could extend that to figure out house prices in a simple scenario. Before we get to this lesson, let's take a look at the exercise answer. You can find the notebook containing the answer at this URL, and I'll step through it next. So let's start by looking at the question. The idea is for you to build a neural network that will be trained to be able to roughly predict the price of a house. If we're saying the cost of a house is a 50K flat fee plus 50K per bedroom, so one bedroom house is 100, two bedroom house 150, etc. So here's the question. So for example, we want to build a neural network that can roughly predict the price of a house where the price is a simple formula of 50,000 plus 50,000 per bedroom. So a one bedroom house is 100, a two bedroom house is 150, etc. And how would we create a neural network that learns that relationship? Now, one way that would make it work better is if you scale the house price down. So instead of you trying to figure out like that a one bedroom house will cost 100,000, maybe you could predict that a one bedroom house will cost one, and then you say that's 100,000. So for example, a seven bedroom house should cost close to 400,000, but maybe you can predict a four off of a seven instead of 400 off a of seven. So here's the starter code that you were given, and let's see what the answer for this was gonna look like. So here's the answer. So you're going to define your model in the same way as we did in the lesson, a single dense layer that has a single unit with an input shape of one. You can compile that with stochastic gradient descent and mean squared error. And now we can do an array of just small float values, like a one bedroom house is 100,000, a two bedroom house is 150,000, a three bedroom house is 200,000, and so on. Then we can fit the x's to the y's, we'll do it over a thousand epochs, and we can see what we get for seven. So I'll run this now. So after a thousand epochs, we're at 1.2 times 10 to the minus six on our loss. And our answer is very, very close to four. It's 4.001622. So we've trained the neural network now to be able to predict that house price. I know it's a very simple formula. House prices aren't really that simple, but hopefully this was able to show you how this type of uh, prediction can be done on just a very small amount of data. While that was a very simple scenario, matching X's to Y's or getting a house price from an oversimplified formula, the key thing here is that the pattern of code that you used, creating a neural network, compiling it with a loss function and an optimizer, and then fitting the data to the labels is the same pattern that you'll use in far more sophisticated scenarios. In this video, we'll start by looking at computer vision and how a computer can learn to see. We'll start simple and we'll build from there. So in understanding vision, ultimately it's all seeing and recognizing things in a field of view. So for example, consider the items of clothing here. If I were to ask you which ones were shoes, you'd probably know right away that it's the high heel and the sneaker. But how did you know that? How could you teach someone who has never seen a shoe before what a shoe is so that they could then tell the difference? What are the rules that make a shoe a shoe? Looking back at the data, how would you come up with the rules to determine a shoe? If it's red, it's a shoe maybe? Well, that works for this data, but we all know that that won't work for all shoes. Computer vision is the field of taking pixels and recognizing what's in them. And the same kind of pattern matching we've been discussing can be used here. But in order to train a neural network to recognize the contents of images, we need data and we need labeled images. Fortunately, there's an easily available dataset called Fashion MNIST. This has 70,000 images sorted and labeled in 10 categories. The images are small, they're 28 by 28, but despite this, they're still recognizable. You can tell that this image is a boot. And because they're small, we can train a neural network quickly using them. We'll start by loading the data. In Keras, there's some built-in data sets that can be loaded with a single line of code, and here it is. Python can return multiple values from a single call, and four values are returned here. First is a set of training images and training labels, and then is a set of test images and test labels. You might wonder why our images have been split into two sets. There's one for testing and there's one for training. 
The idea here is really simple. We'll take a subset of our images, in this case, 60,000 of the 70,000 that we'll train the neural network with. We'll then use the other 10,000 to see how well it performs on images it has never seen before. Think about how you would teach someone who has never seen a shoe before what a shoe looks like. You'd probably get a bunch of shoes and show them. But then there's no point in testing that person on the shoes that you've just shown them, because in that case, you've already told them that those are shoes. Instead, you get a bunch of stuff that they haven't seen before and have them pick out which ones are shoes. It's the same principle here, and it's one that you'll commonly see in building neural networks with machine learning. So, back to our data. We have four lists, one for training images, one for training labels, one for test images, and one for test labels. Our images are the 28 by 28 pixel arrays for the clothing items, like the boot here. And the labels are numbers from zero to nine, indicating the appropriate item of clothing. Now think about this for a second. Why do you think that it would be a number such as nine and not a piece of text like boot? Well, there's two main answers to this. The first is that computers deal better with numbers and we train on neural nets using numbers. The second, a little more subtle, but very important, is that by using a string here that said boot would be introducing a bias that the neural network will need to understand the English word for the clothing item. But we don't want that bias, so we use the number nine instead of the text for ankle boot, which I can then present here in a few different languages. Can you guess what each one is? I'll leave that up to you. So here's what our neural network definition will look like. In the last video, you saw a neural network with a single layer containing a single neuron. Now we have one with three layers. The first layer is called a flatten, and this is a special type of layer in Keras. There's no neurons here, but the idea of the function is to take the rectangular shape of the data, the 28 by 28, and flatten that into a one-dimensional array that can be processed by the next layer, hence the name flatten. This is followed by a dense layer. Now note that there are 128 neurons in this layer. It's significantly larger than the one neuron single layer that we used last time. This is followed in turn by another dense layer, this time one with 10 neurons in it. There's a few important details here that you need to consider and need to remember when designing neural networks. To understand what the network is for, it's always good to look at the top layer and the bottom layer for their shaping. In this case, the top layer takes 28 by 28 for its input, which is the size of the images in our data set. Remember that when building neural networks, all data being fed into training has to be the same size. In this case, it's easy because the data was already in 28 by 28 for us. But later, you'll see that you often need to pre-process your data to get it ready for training. On the output side, we have 10 neurons. Now remember that there were 10 different types of clothing in the data set. This is not a coincidence. The job of each of these neurons will be to calculate the probability that a piece of clothing is for that particular class. You're probably also wondering what these things are. Well, they're another place where neural networks do a lot of math, but fortunately, most of it is encapsulated in parameters for you by TensorFlow. Layers in TensorFlow can have an activation function run on them. Now, this is code that executes while the network is learning. They can be really useful and can save you a lot of time writing code for yourself. The ReLU function here is pretty simple. It basically says that if the output of a neuron is less than zero, set it to zero. The reason for this is that negative outputs could skew results downstream, canceling out positive outputs elsewhere. So we'll just throw them away. Softmax, commonly seen on the final layer if there are multiple categories, simply helps you find the most likely candidate. Remember earlier that I said that each of the neurons on the bottom layer will be a probability that the item of clothing matches that class. That could give you something like this. And instead of you writing code to look through each value and find the largest, softmax will set the largest to one and the rest to zero. So now to get the correct class, you just need to find the one. To illustrate the learning a bit, think about all of the pixel values, which are numbers from zero to 255, being fed into a neuron called N0. And its parameters M0 and C0 are guessed. The same happens for every neuron in the network. Each neuron is initialized with random parameters M and C, and when the pixels of each image in the training set, and that's all 60,000 of them, are fed in one by one, and all the totals from all the neurons added up will get an answer. 
The loss function then calculates how good or how bad that answer is, and the optimizer then tweaks the M's and the C's of the neurons to give it another try. Over time, the values within the neurons will change so that the answers for the training data are fit as accurately as possible to the labels in the training data. This is the same learning that we saw in the single neuron example in the last video. For more detail on how this works under the hood, check out this excellent video from Andrew Wang at deeplearning.ai. So, on the loss function and optimizer, we specify them when we compile the model. This time we'll use an optimizer called Adam, which is a particularly good one for a task like this, and a loss function called sparse categorical cross entropy. Note that when you're classifying multiple categories, and we've 10 here, you're gonna need something categorical. Don't worry if you don't understand what this is or what the options are yet, just go with it. And over time, you'll learn good optimizers and loss functions for specific scenarios. Now, next up, we just want to fit the training data to its labels. And we'll run it for just five epochs this time because there's a lot of data there. Last time when we did the y equals 2x minus 1, we then used model.predict to test our network. Now, that worked for a single value. You can also use model.evaluate to pass it in a list of test data. It takes the test images, gets its prediction, compares that to the answer in the test labels, and then calculates how many it got right and how many it got wrong, returning you an answer. It's a nice one line of code to help you test. And if you want to see the predictions for yourself, you can of course do a model.predict. If you pass it in multiple images, it will return a list of all of the predictions for the respective images. Okay. So that's a run through your first computer vision neural network. Let's now see that code in action in a lab. And after that, you'll be ready to try the next exercise. The lab is at this URL and I'll run through it now. Okay, now let's take a look at this fashion MNIST example. So here's the collab that you'd be working from. The URL was in the video and I'm just gonna step through it. So first we can start by importing TensorFlow and we'll get this warning that the notebook was not authored by Google. That's okay, you can run it anyway. I've also asked it just to print the TensorFlow version so we see what version we're working with. Now, at the time I created this, TensorFlow was at the release candidate 2 for TensorFlow 2.2. If it takes a little while to run that, just keep an eye on this area in the collab, and that's where it's assigning you a VM, and that will give you status of the VM itself. Another thing to do when you're training is to take a look at runtime and look at the runtime type and look at the hardware accelerator that you're using. If your training is going to be really, really slow, um, this is probably set to none. You can actually improve your training by setting that to GPU. In this case, this, is, this isn't a particularly sophisticated data set, so I'm just going to keep it at the CPU that it's, ru that it's running on. Okay, first of all, I'm now going to load the data. I'm just going to specify I want MNIST, and I'm going to use the, ten the TF Keras data sets fashion MNIST. I'm going to get my training images and training labels, my testing images and testing labels. Just download them. It's pretty quick. If we want to take a look at a few of them, this code will help you to do that. First of all, I'm going to take a look at the uh, training labels and the, then the training images and print them out so we can see what that looks like. And if you look kind of closely here, you'll see, even though it's cropped, that it is actually the boot. Now, these images are grayscale, so they're stored as values from 0 through 255. So, for example, the top line of the image here is 28 zeros, so that's like all going to be black. This number 9 is the label because that's what we're printing out first. The second line is all black. The third line is all black, etc. And when I scroll down and actually look at the image, we'll see the image was there. And it's been colorized, but you can see the dark image is there. The dark at the bottom are all these zeros. And then this, all of these numbers are the numbers representing the pixel values here. It is a grayscale, but when I'm just color, when I'm printing it out here, I've colorized it. So one thing that you want to do with your data is to normalize it. Uh, neural networks work best if they're dealing with values between zero and one. And as I mentioned, the values in the pixels in this image are from zero to two five five. So a simple way to normalize that is just divide by two five five. And with Python, if you have an array as we have here or a list. If you just divide the list by 255, it's smart enough to divide all the individual values. You don't have to loop through it and do it yourself. Now we have our neural network is defined. We're flattening, and we have our two denses, 128 and 10. So I'll run that. And now I will compile my model with my loss function, my optimizers, and then I'll train it. And I'm fitting the training images to the training labels, and I'm just going to do it for five epochs. So it's pretty fast. We can see even on a CPU, it's only taking about three seconds per epoch. 
And over here is our accuracy. So the first time around, it was about 82% accurate, which is pretty good because if you think about it, it's a 1 in 10 chance of getting it right. You would expect it to be 10% accurate. So it started off pretty good. The optimizer did a good job of making the first guess. But then by measuring the loss and optimizing again, we can see that it's increasing. So it got up to about 89% here. Once it's done training with those five epochs, we're at 89%. It varies. Uh, sometimes it can be 91, 92%, depending on the initial initialization. But here it's pretty good at 89%. But that's at the images that it was trained on. So this is what images that it's seen. What, how will it do with images that it hasn't seen? And we can use model.evaluate to do that. So here I've passed it the test images and the test labels. It measured its prediction for what it thought it would do, and then it measured its um, against the actual answers, and it got it right 86% of the time. So something here that we've kind of done very simply, and in just five epochs, it's actually 86% accurate with data that it hadn't previously seen. So that's pretty good. And if you want to work through some other exercises, you'll see this, uh, there's some exploration exercises further down in the notebook. You can work through those yourself and try to figure them out. And that will get you ready for the exercise that comes with this video. OK, so you've now seen how to classify items of clothing from Fashion MNIST. There's a similar data set with 28 by 28 grayscale images in 10 classes, and it's handwriting of the digits 0 through 9. See if you can now build a classifier that recognizes handwriting digits in this exercise. Don't worry if you're stuck. I'll give you the answer in the next video. And if you have any questions, please leave them in the comments below. Whatever you do, don't forget to hit that subscribe button for more great TensorFlow content. Thank you.